In the 1970s, the music scene was dominated by disco. Into that world stepped Swedish pop sensation ABBA. With nine number one singles and 17 successive UK hits, they would become the most popular group since the Beatles. ABBA pretty much did what came naturally and uh, you know, it was the right time, the right place, you know, the right country and more important and most important, the right music. But beneath the carefree image, one of the smiling Swedes was hiding a dark secret. A secret that had its roots in wartime Europe. ABBA took the music world by storm when they won the Eurovision Song Contest final in 1974. Some 300 million people throughout Europe watched as the previously unknown Swedish quartet launched their bid for fame. ABBA really created a sensation that day back in 1974 at the finals of the Eurovision Song Contest because the conductor came out dressed like Napoleon. Oh, and it's Napoleon! They came out in very colourful clothes. I mean, they really did make a point. Waterloo by ABBA for Sweden. They really made an effort here. Uh, the costumes were very, very bright. The girls, of course, Frida and Anita, uh, were particularly beautiful. They had uh, long, lovely legs. The legs seemed to go on forever. Uh, the guys I didn't really notice too much, to be honest with you. Uh, but um, I thought the whole effect was terrific. Well, it just hit us all so much, the number one. It was, they were so much the winners. Um, they, they just burst upon the scene and everybody loved them immediately. They've surely got to be up amongst the reckoning with that one. Waterloo won by a landslide, catapulting the group and especially its two glamorous lead singers to instant fame. It's certainly gone down well here inside the Dome in Brighton. I think what made ABBA really stand out in terms of visibility in the 70s throughout their, their big career was perhaps, um, you know, taking the music away, it was probably the girls and the fact that, you know, Anna, Anna Fried, Frida had this kind of mysterious image, the quiet one of the group, and, uh, and Agneta was very much kind of like the pin-up that uh, the, the guys wanted to uh, put up on their wall and, and find out more about, and the guys were kind of quietly in the background churning out the hits. While ABBA went from hit to hit, the group's image and music was kept under strict control. That control continues even today, two decades after the band split up. Their management refused permission for their music to be used in the making of this film. The private lives of the four stars were off limits to the press from the very beginning. They were just paranoid about keeping everything about themselves um, quiet. They wanted to be uh, they wanted to be remembered for their music and they didn't want anything to, uh, from their lives to, to spoil what was a very good commercial operation. They seemed to be very private people. They just went up on stage, sung the songs, and that was it. They didn't seem to do interviews, you didn't know anything else about them, and it seemed that nobody seemed to want to know very much about them. They seemed to be very surface, if you like. Even in their rare interviews, the group was clearly happy answering only the most superficial questions about themselves. The last time you were on, uh, uh, this is Bjorn and Anjeta. Right. You were married. Yeah, yeah we, are. we okay. still are. Still, still are. <laughs> in spite of this year. That's right, in spite of a whole year yeah. of enormous success. Now you talk about something. Now you were engaged. Yes, we right. were. Since you're still yes. engaged. Yeah, we're yes. still engaged. That's a long engagement. She you... won't marry me. She won't? <laughs> Frida, why, you won't, why won't you marry him? I'm too pretty. Oh. But one of them was carrying with her a legacy of the past, a legacy that remained carefully buried despite the worldwide glare of publicity. Almost overnight, ABBA had jumped into the big league. They became an absolute machine that just took over the charts. It seemed as if they could do no wrong, and if they wanted a hit, they would have a hit. As ABBA enjoyed hit after hit, media interest reached its peak. Despite the best efforts of their PR machine, the personal anonymity that they had enjoyed for so long inevitably came under attack. British journalist Harry Edgington was commissioned to write a warts and all biography of ABBA. They were certainly the biggest pop group since the Beatles. 
and they were selling in numbers in some countries that even the Beatles had never sold in places like Australia, certain countries in Europe. They were just a worldwide phenomenon. Nothing got out about their earlier life. So they would be presented as the um, four smiling perfect Swedes. His research took him to Stockholm, where he met a producer who had worked with ABBA since they were teenagers and who was said to know the band better than they knew themselves. Harry soon discovered that there was a dark secret beneath ABBA's untroubled surface. He knew them uh, from their very early days, so that he knew exactly where they'd started from, what had happened, and he knew where all the, all the skeletons were. And they just tumbled out. Harry began by looking at Frida, the quiet one of the band, and soon he knew why. Frida's story was stranger than fiction. Harry had struck gold. I, I had no idea that she had the background that um, I now know. And I, yeah, one can understand why she was quiet about all this. Frida's story led straight back to the horrors of wartime Norway and a secret that had lain dormant for years. With their good looks and flamboyant costumes, it was Frida and Agneta who became the figureheads of the band and the focus of much public and media interest. But it was a role that Frida in particular found difficult to cope with. She didn't say very much, and uh, I think that made her more mysterious and, and perhaps more alluring. We knew very